good morning all of you and welcome back to the second lecture which will be focused on the introduction part to this particular course. Yesterday I gave you a brief outline about uh, the contents. I think one person uh, was not able to come but you can probably get it from your friends. We discussed about the different uh, topics that we will be covering here. So, which will start from the subcontinuum uh, level um, energy carriers and um, you know the transport phenomena associated with them and then we will gradually move towards the micro scale um, single phase convection to uh, you know, phase change convection some nano fluids and applications and all that. I have also given the textbooks and the references that will be useful for this particular course and also the grading pattern. Okay. So, I think these are pretty, pretty much clear I hope. So, today we will go into the introduction part to uh, I mean if you take any generic course on uh, micro scale or nano scale the first thing that you have to understand is uh, the time and length scales that you will be dealing with. So, this particular uh, illustration um, shows you what are the typical length scales. Okay. You can also convert this into an equivalent uh, plot of time scales because um, anything that is associated with the scales of uh, nanometer will also have um, a time scales associated which are of uh, you know the order of uh, maybe picoseconds or femtoseconds you know which will make it again so something uh, like a local thermal non equilibrium or local non equilibrium energy transport. So, wherever you consider very small length scales and also the time scales. So, this is where the what we call as nano scale phenomena start appearing. Okay. So, and when you look at uh, MEMS for example, so which is typically in the micron scale it can span anywhere between 1 micron all the way up to a millimeter. So, you have devices which are built ba based on the MEMS principles which can have all these dimensions ranging between a micrometer and a millimeter. right? So, when you are talking about blood cells you know, so you are talking about of the order of MEMS because these MEMS devices are also devices which are typically used uh, in medical applications you know DNA protein separation you know. So, say such kind of applications. So, you are dealing with um, separation of blood cells for example, from plasma. So, they are also of the order of a micron size and now you can also talk about devices which are now being used may not be within the medical application itself, but you are looking at say um, semiconductor devices which are used in microelectronic components. So, you can talk about microprocessors there. So, which consist of devices made of uh, nanotubes, nanowires or any silicon non insulated device SOIs as they call. So, which make up a fundamental semiconductor device will be of the order of 1 nanometer up to 100 nanometers. So, as the speed of your processor is going up tremendously right. So, we have this Moore's law and we have to scale up um, you know. So, the we have to pack more processors within a given um, square meter or square millimeter uh, cross section of a microprocessor chip and in order to do that you have to rapidly increase the number of transistor or transistor density and to do that you have to look at sub nanometer kind of semiconductor devices which can be accommodated and associated with that will be the problem of heat dissipation. Okay. So, you can you can try fi find a fabrication technology to do that, but how do you deal with the tremendous amount of heat fluxes that are coming out. I will show you um, in a few slides uh, down the line that the kind of heat fluxes we are dealing with in microprocessor chips now are of the order of the heat fluxes of the sun from the sun. So, we have to also maintain these at a fixed temperature preferably around 70, 80 degrees Celsius. So, we have to do a lot of work on the cooling part of removing the heat or heat dissipation from the semiconductor devices. So, we have these uh, devices which are in the sub micron range. So, these are typically used in microprocessors or microelectronics and these are spanning from 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer. So, now your width of the DNA is also the order of a nanometer. Okay. So, now if you want to 
invent any device, it should be a, a nano device or NEMS. Okay, which is uh, dealing with uh, operations with uh, using DNA and so on. So, it should be of the order of nanometer or sub nanometer. So, these are the typical length scales right now that people have been dealing with. Okay, we have not really gone into sub nanometer length scales till now, at least not uh, we do not have any applications on that, but we have I mean maybe if you take 50 years back or even 30, 40 years back, we did not have applications ranging sub micron. Okay, we used to deal with if you are dealing with a millimeter range you know a device that was considered really um, you know a small device you know and still that that was operating in the continuum range. So, on the right hand side here you can see that the corresponding the de description of transport processes how they are associated with the length scales. So, if you are talking about uh, micron size and above so you can still use your classical continuum uh, mechanics okay, which uh, basically use the Navier-Stokes equation for describing the, the fluid flow transport and for example, constitutive relationship which links your for example, heat flux with your temperature gradient. So, to, so, so, so this is required to close the Navier-Stokes equation, Typis, uh, also similar is your a Newton, uh, Newtonian um, the assumption of a Newtonian fluid and the Newton's law of viscosity. So, you need that to close your equations Navier-Stokes equations so that you can solve them. So, you rather than leaving them in terms of stresses you need to express them in terms of velocities and similarly the energy equation in terms of temperatures. So, you use these constitutive laws to uh, fill this particular gap. So, also all these are valid only if you have the assumption of continuum. So, so far if you look at devices 30 years before, so they were all dealing with this kind of devices which are of the order of millimeter and above and everything was working with the continuum assumption. And suddenly when uh, people in the, the microprocessor industry were just scaling down their devices at such a rapid pace and you had uh, you know uh, devices which are going to the order of nanometers and suddenly people wanted to study the heat dissipation mechanisms and they failed using the Fourier's law and this is where the subcontinuum uh, use of subcontinuum theories started emerging. Although they were present even before the nanometer devices were discovered definitely you know in physics we have particle based theories you know we have um, Boltzmann transport equation and all of these existed um, almost 100 years before, but nevertheless the application of these theories um, to submicron level has emerged only in the last 30 years or so and particularly when you are dealing with uh, nanometer sized devices only in the last 5 to 10 years have these uh, kind of uh, applications picked up. Okay. So, this is to just give a broad idea about the overall scales that we are able to deal with you know ranging from a nanometer to kilometer. So, also to give an idea about the amount of research that has been done you know this this gives you also the trend of uh, you know a, a volume of research that has been uh, growing over the period of time from 1990 till about you know 2010 I would say you know I have not compiled the data in the last uh, 5, 6 years, but you can see that it has been increasing very steadily and you can see in 1990 for example less than you know it is a very small fraction you know it is almost negligible percentage of uh, the total research that has been related to nanoscale. It could be nanoscale heat transfer, it could be nano scale you know any phenomena in physics, chemistry or material science you know my making micro nano structured uh, material synthesis, it, it could be anything, but that was only a negligible fraction of the total body of research that was existing at that time. And suddenly you see in one year 90 to 91. So, there was a big jump you know. So, of all the research 1 percent was occupied out of uh, the entire volume of research the, um, uh, the publications related to nano is now steadily increasing that clearly shows the importance of uh, this towards the applications that we are dealing with ok. And again this is another plot um, which shows you the instead of the length scale now we used a different parameter which we are now introducing 
this is called the Knudsen number. Okay. So, a Knudsen number is a non dimensional parameter, so which is defined uh, as the ratio of your mean free paths to the characteristic length scale that you are using. Okay. So, therefore, when you are talking about uh, a Knudsen number which is very, very high, so you are talking about either very large mean free path between the energy carriers. We, we will define all these in detail, but I think you should understand that the rough idea of uh, looking at mean free path is the approximate distance that uh, energy carriers have to travel before they collide with each other. Okay. So, for example, if you take uh, molecules, so if you are talking about rarefied gases, for example, we do not encounter rarefied gases so commonly you know in uh, earth conditions, but when you are travelling to the outer space, so as in when you are leaving the atmosphere, you are encountering the rarefied phenomena. So, so, P, so in those uh, cases, uh, you can actually come to a stage where your Knudsen number is exceeding 100 and then slowly approaching infinity. Okay. So, rarefied gases are one good example where you know with respect to molecules as the energy carriers you can have a very high Knudsen number. The other example is you can deal with earth phenomena, but you can talk about phenomena happening at very small characteristic length scales. So, since we define Knudsen number as the ratio of mean free paths to the characteristic length scale, it can be that you can also have very small length scale. Uh, the mean free path could be absolutely normal, it could be of the order of you know nanometers or whatever it is at you know at the normal atmospheric conditions. However, the device dimension is too small that the energy carriers cannot actually have multiple collisions with themselves, but they collide with the boundaries of the system and therefore, this could also lead to a subcontinuum kind of a transport. So, therefore, a very high Knudsen number here indicates that we are deviating completely away from the equilibrium continuum theories. Okay. So, everything is non-equilibrium, so there is also a local non-equilibrium existing and a very high uh, Knudsen number approaching infinity means it is a completely free, free molecular limit. Okay. So, the molecules hardly even see each other. So, they only see the boundaries of the domain if you have a closed domain. And on the other hand, if you are talking about Knudsen number which is extremely small, so then you are talking about uh, the conventional um, uh, you know continuum based approximation. So, where you have a lot of molecules statistically large enough to describe you know pro properties such as you know pressure, temperature um, and so on. Okay. So, this is how you define a continuum and associate a particular property inside the continuum and this is valid at the small Knudsen number limit. Okay. At the small Knudsen number limit, so you, you have the device dimensions which is substantially larger compared to your mean free path. So, that you have enough collisions of uh, energy carriers happening that you can statistically um, use some theory to describe an average property or anything within this particular system. So, therefore, if you are looking at classification of uh, the theories, whether they are either a continuum or subcontinuum, so usually they are classified on based of Knudsen number. It is hard to say whether you can use continuum model if your length scale is of the order of microns. Okay. It is also possible that your length scale could be of the order of microns, but your mean free path could also be extremely large. Okay. So, in that case still your continuum theories may fail. Okay. So, the right way to classify whether you can use a continuum approach or a subcontinuum approach is to look at the non-dimensional Knudsen number. So, typically all your continuum models will be valid if you are approaching a Knudsen number close to 0. Okay. That is your theoretical um, hypothetical you know, assumption that your mean free path or your length scales are much, much larger than your mean free path and you know therefore, you have a very, very small Knudsen number of the order of 0 0.0001 or something like that and there you can definitely use your continuum model. And as and when you know you are increasing your Knudsen number that is either by increasing your mean free path or decreasing your length scales, slowly you start deviating from the continuum assumption. So, when you do an experiment, you find that certain phenomena emerge. For example, if you have 
flow of gases. Okay, so, gases have actually a larger mean free path compared to the liquids. So, more likely you will start observing these uh, uh, phenomena in gases compared to liquids. So, the first thing that you will observe is what we call as a slip that is happening between uh, the fluid and the boundary. Okay. So, your classical continuum theory always says that your fluid cannot slip the wall, you know there is always a no slip boundary condition and the fluid has to possess the same velocity as the solid. Okay. Now, as your Knudsen number keeps increasing, you see that this particular phenomena emerges where there is a slip coming up and how do we now account for this. So, there are theories which say that if your Knudsen number is in a reasonable range, something like point up to point 0.1 let us say, okay, you can still use your continuum theory like your Navier-Stokes equation, but we can correct for the condition at the wall by introducing some slip. Okay. So, instead of using a no slip, we give a partial slip or a slip, but that we do not know how much of slip has to be given. Okay. So, that from the experimental data we have to find out and you have to give the corresponding um, the quantity or parameter of slip that is required. So, that is one theory and if your Knudsen number exceeds this value of 0.1, even the continuum approximation outside will break down and therefore, you cannot use any form of continuum approximation. So, so therefore, what is used as I referred to yesterday is the Boltzmann transport equation. Okay, the Boltzmann transport equation is actually a subcontinuum model which can also be used in the continuum level and we will also see that we can derive these continuum equations from the Boltzmann equation. This is the most fundamental equation. And this Boltzmann equation has two parts. Okay, we will I'll sh come to that, but I am just explaining orally. So you have a particular uh, term which is an advection term. Okay, so it's similar to your advection term that you have in your Navier-Stokes equation. The other term is basically your collision term. Okay, so you can think that you know this advection is equivalent to the advection in of a in a Navier-Stokes equation, but it is exa exactly not that because if you do what we call as a taking a moment higher order moments and recover your Navier-Stokes, also some advection comes out of the collision term here because the collision term also plays the role of um, you know advecting the fluid as well as diffusing. So, we have two terms, so one is an advection, the other is a collision term in the Boltzmann equation. So, this collision can still be significant at small nodes and numbers. Okay. And as you keep increasing the Knudsen numbers to a very large value, finally you can reach a state where there is no collision possible between the energy carriers and that term goes to 0 and you have a purely hyperbolic equation which has only the advection term. Okay. So, that equation is called the collisionless Boltzmann equation. So, that is used when, when you are approaching the free molecular limit on one hand. So, you know if you are using the Boltzmann equation you can use it for all kinds of Knudsen number ranges. However, the computational effort that will be required to solve the Boltzmann equation is tremendously large compared to the Navier-Stokes and especially when you are approaching the continuum limit, uh, small Knudsen number, you will find that it becomes very inefficient to solve the Boltzmann equation and therefore, we just come back to the Navier-Stokes and directly solve it. Whereas for larger Knudsen numbers, we typically have to definitely go away from the continuum Navier-Stokes equations and use something like the Boltzmann transport equation. People also talk about doing molecular dynamics. Okay. So, there is a catch in using the Boltzmann transport equation. It requires that you know what is the mean free path of the energy carriers and so on. Okay. Sometimes you may not even know this. And also sometimes you may need to even in order to solve the energy equation through the Boltzmann transport, you need to know things like heat capacity and so on, which you may not also have a priori knowledge. So, to understand to get the physical properties, so you need to even go to the molecular level, just look at uh, you know fundamental molecular interactions, describe them with some kind of potentials and solve them for all the molecules within the system 
So, this is called molecular dynamics. It is the simplest you just apply the Newtonian principle, but the interaction potential between the molecules will bring out all the difference and that is again something which is not easy to know. Most of the common potentials uh, that are used are the inert gas potentials and they are also used for even atoms and so on which is a big approximation. So, people working in molecular dynamics are steadily developing newer and better potentials, but apart from that it is just solving f equal to ma for the entire system of atoms or molecules within the system. So, it, it is limited only to a small system you cannot do this for a very large system you know you, you cannot rely on molecular dynamics it is too ex, in expensive computationally, but to understand the thermophysical properties this can be done and that can be plugged into Boltzmann transport equation and the non-equilibrium phenomena can be studied from that ok. So, there are different ways of doing this, but nevertheless this slide clearly tells you that you know depending on the kind of Knudsen numbers you have to be uh, you know you have to know that where the continuum approximation ends and where you have to go to subcontinuum models ok. So, when we therefore, talk about continuum I think which most of you are already aware. So, we are assigning certain properties to certain small finite volumes or control volumes where which in which within which we are make an assumption that continuum approximation is valid. So, therefore, within this particular control volume we assign certain properties ok which is a statistical average of all the molecules present within this continuum ok. We say that you this particular continuum has a defined pressure, temperature, density and so on. The classical plot to describe the continuum which I do not have it here, but I will show it in the the coming lectures is your way you plot your density that is delta m by delta v as a function of your delta v right. So, as you have a very small control volume size ok this quantity which is nothing but the density will not be consistent. So, if your control volume size is too small you will not have enough molecules within the system to define a stable statistical ensemble property called density. So, that will show lot of fluctuations right and then as you increase your control volume size to accommodate more and more molecules then you will reach a point where you have a stable value and the property called density emerges and that becomes constant and there is a therefore, a, a critical volume of this um, or size of this control volume. So, which is required to define this concept of continuum ok. So, less than this you do not have enough molecules to describe a property like density above this it becomes stable and therefore, you can use this continuum assumption. So, this is a very important concept that you learn when you first start your um, fluid mechanics or heat transfer or thermodynamics this is the assumption of continuum and what is continuum ok. So, and you never know what is on the left side of this critical volume ok, what happens you are always dealing with the right side. So, what happens to this left side? So, that is where you have to go into the subcontinuum models right. So, I think all this uh, pretty much known to you. So, I am not going to spend more time on defining continuum validity of continuum assumption we have already seen that ok. So, on mean free path I will just come back to this derivation. I will just put it here. So, what is required is this particular definition of Knudsen number here. So, if I right now you you are you just assume that you know how to calculate the mean free path of energy carriers in different medium it could be uh, liquids, it could be gases, it could be solids. So, once you know this particular quantity called the mean free path you define the Knudsen number and then we classified the different regimes based on the Knudsen number. So, once again you know I am bringing the same kind of uh, uh, you know explanation in different ways. So, this is again another plot which uh, shows Knudsen number variation 
from a very small value to a very large value from left to right and therefore again talking about where the continuum approximation is valid okay, and where we can use continuum model but with maybe a correction at the boundary conditions for the slip. Okay. So, that is a slightly rarefied regime and then you have a moderately rarefied people classify this as transition and all that, but still there is a lot of doubt whether you can use the continuum model there okay. and once you go to large Knudsen numbers definitely. So, the degree of rarefaction, so the rarefaction here is a term which is applied with gases generally. Okay. When you are talking about electrons or other energy carriers uh, you do not uh, use this word rarefaction, but commonly with gases we talk about rarefaction. So, but however for all the energy carriers we still use the Knudsen number to classify the flow regime and then we also say that for Knudsen numbers greater than 10 or for large Knudsen numbers the validity of the continuum model reduces. Okay. So, here um, it gives the typical values of uh, you know Knudsen numbers that you are dealing with in different systems. Okay. This is a plot I have taken from um, Karniadaki's book okay. that is that is also a, a, a book related to micro scale flows, but uh, also some emphasis is on the modeling part okay. that is why I have not included that in your references. Um, so, so, this particular plot here shows what are the typical values of um, length scales that you are dealing with in different systems and also the corresponding um, kind of theory or validity of the continuum model and so on. So, for example, uh, on the so here on the y axis you are plotting the Knudsen number and on the x axis corresponding x axis you have the length scale right. So, if you take typically your devices like for example, micro valves or micro nozzles. Okay. So, these are of the order of micron size and as you can see the maximum length scale that we are dealing here is of the order of 10 microns. Okay. So, even the micron size is enough to use the continuum model here. Okay. We do not have to talk about large scale mechanical devices here. So, we are talking about even micro valves and micro nozzles which of the order of microns, few microns and you know if you take the example of uh, you know air for example and define the Knudsen number. So, the Knudsen number comes to the order of 0 0.01 and, you know and below. Okay. So, therefore, very clearly for these cases you can use the continuum based models. Right? Now, if you are going to certain other areas you know they could be a micro channels or micro pumps with gas flow. Okay micro channels with liquids still would be in the continuum range because their mean free paths of liquids are smaller. Whereas, if you if you operate micro channels with gases it is quite likely the Knudsen number can exceed 0.1 okay, as you can see in this particular this square symbol here. right? So, it can cross 0.1 and you can actually be in a slip or a transitional regime. So, in that case you still probably can use your continuum model Navier-Stokes equation, but you, you have to account for the slip conditions happening at the boundary okay, through corrections and so on. And now when you are going to the size of your hard disk drive, okay, so in your hard disk drive you know so, so it is rotating at such high speeds and there is a laser which is always you know pointed the laser head is so close to the to the actual drive that is rotating to retrieve this information so that the separation distance is less than 0.1 micron so, so this is like what 100 nanometers that you are talking about so you are already now approaching the nanometer regime and the air which is in that gap so we'll be experiencing a Knudsen number which is of the order of 1 and above okay so in such a case clearly you are gone away from your continuum approximation. So, so in that case you have to when you are solving um, equations to describe the transport of air which is between the, the head and between the particular drive. So, you are talking about you know, high Knudsen numbers and therefore, you have to 
look at subcontinuum models to solve this particular equation. Oh, so, this is a kind of a plot which gives you an idea even between scales ranging from microns to the order of nanometers, you can see a rapid demarcation in the flow regimes. You start from continuum up to the order of say 1 microns, but suddenly below 1 micron something happens and then again your continuum loss break down and you start looking at subcontinuum models. Okay. So, this is again another plot for example, if you take a micro channel with gas flows. Okay. So, you have say two different micro channels and then you plot the uh, corresponding variation of Mach number. See the Mach number here is plotted to also classify the flow regime as either compressible or incompressible okay. and you also have a Reynolds number variation on the x axis to classify the flow as either laminar or turbulent and now on top of that you can also plot these patterns the pattern map here for different channel diameters and this can be classified based on the corresponding nodes and numbers. Okay. So, if you are talking about uh, these are all in the order of microns. Okay. So, if you are talking about 60 mi 200 microns. Okay. So, if you are talking about the channel diameter of the order of 200 microns they are still in the continuum regime. So, 60 microns will be moving towards the left and so on and so forth and as you start reducing the size of these dimensions to the order of 1 micron you might start experiencing the slip regime here. And once again within the slip regime you can actually vary the Reynolds number drastically all the way you know from this end to this end and also you can also transition from an incompressible to a compressible regime. So, all these flow conditions are possible. So, this is a typical flow pattern map. Okay. So, you can classify whether it is a laminar or turbulent flow depending on the Reynolds number or compressible or incompressible flow and you can also have a very high Knudsen number flows depending on the length scales. So, all this is all this variation is possible okay, if you are reducing the channel size you know and then nowadays people are looking at using micro channels for a lot of applications and especially so for cooling. Okay. So, uh, I mean we are now looking at also uh, convection. So, we have so far focused on the application of continuum or subcontinuum models depending on Knudsen number. Now, we are also looking at convection aspects where it is it's of the order of micron size and above. One typical example is the micro channel. So, micro channels are gaining lot of importance it is not just a fundamental device where you see some uh, phenomena happening at micro scale, but the more important application is in cooling electronic circuits. So, here this particular figure shows that you have a microchip okay, microprocessor. Now, there are different levels of cooling in a chip okay, which I think I, sh I will try to bring out in the slide here. Okay, I think probably I should describe this before I go there. So, in microelectronic cooling you have different levels of cooling. So, the first level of cooling okay, is happening from the, the, the heat generation which is happening within the semiconductors of the order of nanometers inside your chip. Okay, your chip consists of billions of semiconductor devices and that is where the heat generation is happening and that has to be removed from the chip to the chip carrier or the substrate. Okay. So, you have basically what we call as a packaging. Okay. The, the chip is actually it is not just a standalone thing it is actually packaged to a substrate and now this chip packaging could be of the order of 1 millimeter or few millimeters. Okay. Now, from that you have a larger level uh, plate or a casing which is of the order of centimeters. Okay. So, now from this you have to remove it to the ambient. Okay. So, this is how the multiple length scales play a role in removing the heat dissipation. The so, heat generation happens at nanometers and then first level is happening as a heat dissipation to the 
chip carrier or substrate. Now this is mostly happening due to the contact resistance, okay. So this is bonded to the substrate and this has to be therefore overcoming the contact resistance and so on. So that is purely material phenomena and from the substrate you have to remove it to the casing. Now this substrate is of the order of millimeter square. So this there is a possibility that we can actually um, put a micro channel inside this, okay. We can etch micro channels, parallel micro channel system into the substrate and therefore we can make this transfer of uh, heat from the substrate to for example the cold plate outside much easier. From the cold plate the conventional techniques are all standard. You can have either heat pipes to remove the heat to the ambient or you can have fan or impingement cooling. So these are working at the macro scale, okay. So these are the normal techniques that have, that have been used and they have been very well understood. But what is not understood is how do we dissipate the heat from the level 1 and level 2. So level 3 heat dissipation is fairly you know has been worked out for the last 10, 20 years and it's been clear but many times you will fi find that the, uh, the processor fails because of the problems with level 1 or level 2, okay. Now so this classification was done by Nakayama in 1988 and it is broadly used you know by the people working in the electronic cooling industry to understand the heat removal, okay. So coming to this, so you can now understand that this micro channel cooling system can fit into the level 2 of cooling, okay. The level 1 of cooling is purely a material science, more efficient materials which can with, with high um, um, thermal conductivity and less interfacial thermal resistance. So that is basically a material science problem usually, okay and not uh, um, what we can do as uh, you know as mechanical or thermal engineers, okay. What we can probably do is predict it, predict the heat dissipation but beyond that it is a material science problem whereas level 2 is a place where we can use these micro MEMS devices like micro channels and this is where the concept of attaching the micro channel okay as a heat sink directly to the substrate okay. So and that dissipates the heat to the third level okay and from there it goes to the ambient which is the ultimate sink right. So this is a, a conceptual picture like how you can basically attach a parallel micro channel system to the microchip or the carrier or the substrate. Now why do we use micro channels? So typically if you see that uh, Nussel number what we have um, you know, defined in heat transfer is uh, for the laminar flow for a fully developed laminar flow it is a constant value, right. So for example for the case of a uniform surface temperature it is exactly 3.66, okay. For a constant wall flux it is 4.3. So similarly if you are talking about developing flow you have function of your Reynolds number and your Prandtl number and if you are again looking at turbulent flow it is again a function of Reynolds number Prandtl number given by the dietz bolter equation, okay. Whatever may be finally the Nusselt number is either a fixed value or for a given specified Reynolds and Prandtl number it is again a constant, okay. So irrespective of what kind of dimensions you are dealing with. So therefore according to this principle if you apply the scaling it tells you that as your diameter of the channel scales down goes down your corresponding heat transfer coefficient will also go up, okay. That means if you are reducing your channel dimension from a millimeter to a micrometer, okay. So three orders of magnitude down your H value goes three orders of magnitude up which results in very high values of heat transfer rate because according to the Newton law of cooling Q is equal to H A delta T. Okay. So as your heat transfer coefficient goes up three orders of magnitude your heat transfer rate goes up and this is the very simple uh, way of explaining why a micro channel system is more efficient than using a ma macro channel system, okay. So all you are doing is scaling down bringing down the diameter and therefore increasing the overall heat transfer rate. So the one way of looking at it is you are increasing the surface area to the volume ratio. So therefore more surface area is available for effective heat dissipation. 
okay and most of the micro channels okay now that that are being proposed to be used with micro electronics they all work with liquids you don't uh, come out with gases because gases have low thermal conductivity and therefore their um, you know heat transfer performance which will be lower than using liquid so most of them employ liquids and also not generally water could be one possibility um, there could also be using refrigerants you know liquids with lower boiling points depending on the kind of temperature that you want to achieve right so if you are talking about temperatures of the order of 70 80 degrees water will be perfectly fine but if you are talking about maintaining temperatures uh, maybe of the order of 50 degrees 40 degrees then you have to go for liquids with lower boiling points and high volatility right so this uh, is generally what is used and you look at the order of uh, heat transfer coefficient that is plotted as a function of diameter here so if you take water for example if you are talking about the you know millimeter sized um, you know um, uh, channels okay the conventional channels so your heat transfer coefficient is very small whereas if you are reducing the channel diameter to the order of uh, you know a few microns okay you are tremendously increasing so it's a linear plot you can see that okay so proportional to the reduction in um, h uh, d is your increase in the h whether you use water or air you can see that naturally your water is having a higher heat transfer coefficient than air and that is why it's usually used as the working fluid okay so i think uh, just uh, i want to also show you one more slide because now we are talking about electronic cooling so one last slide before we stop here and so we, when we talk about microelectronics people generally refer to moore's law which says that every second year your transistor density will keep doubling okay so that is the amount of transistors that you basically package within a given cross sectional area so okay th so that's supposed to double every second year in order to account for the tremendous increase in the computing power processing speed okay but unfortunately there is a bottleneck to that and that bottleneck is what the heat dissipation okay the moore's law never moore never knew that you know just uh, the the uh, if you just keep uh, scaling up you know just packing more and more transistors so you it will be he thought that the computing power will increase of course but he didn't realize that also the associated heat transfer becomes a big bottleneck okay and the heat dissipation uh, how to remove this heat generated at the source efficiently is what he didn't predict and that is why we don't now scale exactly with moore's law it is slowing down okay if you look at the um, kind of uh, um, you know processor speeds now we have reached a limit i don't think which we can increase tremendously we have reached maybe more than 3 gigahertz for example if you look at the clock speed of your computers now um, if you look at your clock speeds 10 years back that time anything above 1 gigahertz was something really terrific speed okay and if you looked at something 3 years back we had already were close to 3 gigahertz okay and now in the last 3 years we have really not achieved you know 4 or 5 or 6 gigahertz okay we are still at around 3 gigahertz and we are almost saturated there okay the thing is the higher the the clock speed that means the more should be the device uh, the transistor density so that the communication can be faster but the heat transfer is a big bottleneck so most of the electronic devices fail because of cooling problems okay not because of any other um, you know fundamental hardware difficulties but it's because of inefficient cooling the same laptop which you operate in an air conditioned environment works perfectly fine and you put it outside in a normal non air conditioned room within a few days it might give you a trouble okay so therefore if you look at the corresponding heat fluxes that are generated from microelectronic devices now you are talking about already it has crossed you know for uh, the kind of clock speeds that we are discussed it has crossed the fluxes at the surface of a sun so that is more than 100 watts per centimeter square the heat fluxes are tremendous but at the same time we need to maintain the temperature of 
the um, uh, semiconductor device not more than 80, 90 or 100 degrees beyond which it will fail. Okay. So, therefore, the emphasis will be on very efficient heat dissipation here. So, it is uh, very important that we integrate efficient heat prediction systems, heat prediction methodology. First, you have to predict how much of heat is actually dissipated. So, if you are talking about nanometers, you cannot use the Fourier's law to do this prediction. If you do not predict it right, you are definitely going to design your cooling system inefficiently. So, once the prediction is done properly, then you can build the appropriate support system. So, advances in materials, materials will be uh, one good thing at level 1 and then incorporating technologies such as micro channels and other micro heat pipes will be very efficient at level 2 and also very efficient phase change heat transfer. For example, impingement cooling with phase change could be a very efficient mechanism of heat removal at level 3. So, with these kind of things, you can probably deal with some of these issues. Okay. So, we will stop here today and um, tomorrow we will also look at some other um, applications or some other examples of uh, you know particularly with respect to heat transfer. So, thank you.